McDonald, aka Lady Bam, and my producer Mina Sharp. And it is a couple of days. Well, it's actually, what is it, Mina? Is the it? 30th? The day before, New the Year. day before. It's the day before the day before. So it's like the Eve Eve. Yeah. Oh, it's New Year's Eve Eve. Ha ha ha. So we're getting close to 2020, and um, I know I'm looking forward to it. I would imagine everyone is. And there is, in my opinion, a feeling of energy in the air. Mm -hmm. It feels very different to you. Is that true with you, Mina? It does. It, there's, there seems to be a, a change happening, and I'm excited for it. Yeah. It's like that old song, something's happening <laughs> here. Exactly. And it isn't exactly clear, right? But there yeah. is something, and it feels something very... Shifting. Listen, let me ask you this, Mina. Does it feel different to you than 18 into 19, 2018 and 2019? It feels slightly more hopeful, maybe? Yeah, me too. Okay. And it feels to me more, it doesn't feel like it's going to be easy. Like, it's yeah. not going to go away. It's going to get harder. Yeah. But it feels like it's more vital. There's yeah. more vitality and more energy. I think we were so shocked and worn down. And now we're clear. Yeah. And it's we're going galvanized. to be... We're, we're ready, galvanized. We're and it's been wild here and everywhere, really, environmentally. That's mm -hmm. where we're really going to have to fight. Mm -hmm. um, and I think 2019 made it crystal clear. Yeah. I mean, just thinking about the fires here. Fires. I mean, you and I were in a tornado in <laughs> Dallas. <laughs> that was amazing. Um, I got a tornado warning driving back from my mother's house. You on did? Christmas Day. I know, I in, heard about that. In, in California. So yeah, apparently. Is this happening now? Yeah, apparently a tornado touched down somewhere just north of L.A. Or we're in trouble. But we're alive and well, and there's so many extraordinary people out there who are leading the charge. I think one of the biggest and most amazing revelations this year is the gift of Greta Thunberg. Mm -hmm. She is just off the charts, a leader, a thinker, and courageous as hell. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of people out there like that. We're, we are in good shape if we decide to become active. So, anyway, with all that being said, I just had to muse for a minute because it's the eve of the eve and I just realized that. Um, we had a little music for you this year that's new. We're opening a window that way and that beautiful tune is by one of my favorite bands, certainly my favorite band in Southern California, uh, Tumbleweed and they generously allowed us to use their tune. So that feels good and new and exciting too. Um, many of you know Tumbleweed. If you don't, go find them. Um, now, this podcast uh, that you're about to hear was recorded in New York City in October. Mm -hmm. As you all know, I had the great honor of representing the life of Gloria Steinem in a play by Emily Mann, written and directed by Emily Mann at the amazing McCarter Theater in Princeton. And we did that in September, part of October. We rehearsed in August. And I had the most amazing experience with the women on the stage, with Emily, with the crew, and with the audience every night. And we went through a lot. This particular ensemble of women, we got to know each other because we had to. In order to participate in Gloria Steinem's energy and in her world and in her commitment to communication and her gift of the talking circle, we experienced things together about each other and about the world of women and humans, really. That was kind of extraordinary. So... The cast, I'm just going to tell you everybody's name if you haven't seen it. It was Mirka Gurton, Erica Stone, Eunice Wong, Brenda Withers, Petrina Murray, and Gabrielle Beckford. And my plan, our plan, Mina's actually came up with this plan, is to eventually, we hope, be able to talk to everyone that participated in this event because it was something else. A great deal of them, by the way, are moving on to join um, one of the actresses from the original New York production. I will not be with them, but many of them are joining. Patricia Callenberg will be playing Gloria, and uh, um, a lot of this cast that I had the great pleasure of spending a few months with will be joining her. And our plan, Mina and mine, plan is to 
Um, get up to Cambridge. It's at ART, directed by Diane Paulus, and she directed the New York production originally last year with Christine Lottie. Our plan is to be able to get up there at some point during the run and interview for the, our more podcasting the rest of the cast of Gloria because there's so much to talk about and because Gloria Steinem and Emily created inside the energy of this play the potential for the deepest of conversations and so we want to keep going and we want to keep going to support this play being done everywhere. I would love to see this play done all over the world frankly and one of the beauties about this play as created and as written is it's stated at the top of the play that Gloria can be played by an actress of any age and any race. And to me, that is a mind-blowing paradigm shift in how we interpret plays. The play has a structure that I have to say is what I witnessed as feminine in its energy and the way it, it moves forward. And it has a circular motion to it the entire time. So everything about this piece that Emily created around Gloria's life is new. And I want everyone to see it. So anyway, so that's the overall, that's sort of the framing of this particular podcast that we shot in a hotel room in New York City in October. You will hear sirens. You will hear a heating unit going on and off. It's a little um, perfect because that's where we were and it was fun. The two actresses that I had the great pleasure to speak to were Petrina Murray and Gabrielle Beckford. And part of why I wanted to go with them first is that one of the most revealing things to me about this play when I read it and night after night doing it was the story of how the black women activists created Gloria Steinem, the activist, and that she was mentored by some extraordinary African-American women in our culture who fought for all of our feminist rights at a time where the civil rights movement led into the feminist movement. So Gabrielle and Petrina portrayed some of these most outstanding women and I wanted to go into speaking with them first about that because to me that was one of the great reveals of the play is that so much of what we all over this country and all over the world consider freedoms that we take for granted were fought for originally by black women and that to me is something we all need to know and continue to celebrate the way black women keep leading us forward. Anyway, this is a Happy New Year gift to you. We had a ball doing this and we got down and there were some things that get revealed in this podcast that you have to take a moment for. I love these two women dearly. I think they're both brilliant. And without further ado, here we have Gabrielle Beckford and Petrina Murray brought to you by Mina and Mary Lady Bam Podcast. So here we are. Hi, everybody. It's Mary, uh, Lady Bam, and Mina, Lady Bam producer, and we haven't uh, we haven't been out here with you in a while. You know we've been busy. We've been uh, in Princeton, New Jersey, doing Gloria of Life, which many of you came to see. Might I add, many times, and I know you're out there listening, and we are deeply grateful for your presence and your commitment your enthusiasm, and the beautiful, the absolutely beautiful things you wrote about Gloria a life. So many of you weren't there. More of you weren't there than were able to attend. And my feeling is that any time you see this play being produced anywhere from here on out, no matter what country you're in, because our hope is that it spreads worldwide, go see the piece because I know a little bit about this audience that's listening right now, and I trust that this piece will be meaningful, inspirational, and it will be grounding for you at a time where we all feel a little knocked off our pins by what's happening in the world. So, so here we are, Lady Bam Podcast. We're starting it up again, and I have two very, very, very dear, special friends here today. Two of the actresses in Gloria Alive, 
are here with me. I ask them to be my first Pass to Glory of Life interviewees, and I'm really happy to have them. I was in New York for a couple of days. They both live here. I have Katrina Murray, and I have Gabrielle Bentley, and we are really happy to see each other, first of all. Gabrielle, have you, my dear, ever done a podcast? No, I have hey. never done a podcast. I didn't think so, and I'm so excited. a podcast. Yay! And, uh, when you said yes, what was it that allowed you to say yes? I mean, what is it that motivates you to to want to be here today? Other than the fact we get to see each other again, it's great. <laughs> yes, right. Other than the fact that we get to see each other, yeah. it's just such an honor to be on a, this sort of platform to be able to speak my truth and to tell my story or to tell the story of a lot of people who I grew up with or who people who look like me in this industry especially and just letting people know our side of things and then our interpretation of what's going on, not only in this world, but in this genre of theater that we happen to be doing today. Fantastic. Fantastic. How about you? This is my third <laughs> podcast. Your third podcast. Yes. Oh, darn it. <laughs> uh, no, I, I kind of had a feeling you'd done one before, at least. <laughs> And do you like talking? Do you like speaking as well in this format? I mean, do you? I like it because if I don't want to, I don't have to put on lipstick. <laughs> I do anyway. But <laughs> I always feel put on the spot because I never know what to say. I don't find that I'm a very eloquent person. Oh Sometimes my I am, I think. But for the most part, I worry. But I do like not having to dress up or, yeah. you know, yeah. it's not a television interview or you know so that's right and also it doesn't have to be at six in the morning yeah you know i mean here we are it's it's about three thirty four p.m in new york folks so we're just happy as clams because yeah. we could get stuff done today and we can go out later on and right in the middle at that time like that three to four o'clock time when you don't know what to do with yourself we're doing this so i love it so patrina i'm kind of surprised to hear you say that you don't feel uh that you're very eloquent is that the word you used? Yes. yes. Because um, I think you are, and I've, I've heard you speak spontaneously in front of audiences and deal directly during the talking circle, not words that you had prepared. And it's very, very direct and eloquent, and you seem very comfortable. So I'm wondering why you had that idea. And I'm tickled by women because we all have secret, dare I say, negative ideas about ourselves that are completely false that we harbor, that we like sort of admit and we don't admit, but I love that you just admit it. So, I, so let's go at that. Like, yeah, why do you think that? It's just one of my biggest fears that, that in the moment I won't have the right words to express what I, I feel as though I feel a lot, but I don't always have the language, the words to express what, I, what I'm feeling or what I'm thinking. Do you take your time in those moments or do you... What do you, what's your experience? Do you take time to find the words? I understand. I relate, actually. I yeah. usually end up listening unless I'm really passionate. If I'm very passionate about it, then I'm like, I have to say something. But for the most part, I find that I listen. Right. You're comfortable listening. Mm. Yeah. When you are passionate and the words come flooding out, despite you, in a way, despite you're like, I don't want to, do they line up well? I bet they do. I think they do. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. yeah. How about you, Gabrielle? Do you like to speak? Or do you run into any roadblocks? I relate to what Pacino was saying because sometimes you you fear that you'll say the wrong thing or you feel like you know what you're thinking. For me, like I know what I'm thinking sometimes. Right. It may take a second for the word to come on. You'd be like, wait, no, I meant to say this. But I know what I, I mean. I know what I intend. Just sometimes, I guess putting it out and hoping that it all comes out the way that you think it's supposed to come out. Right. That's the whole ordeal for yes. me. So I understand that whole concept of fearing what to say if you're going to have the right thing to say. Right. You want it to come out the right way. Right. So, yeah. Did you ever say something that you thought made absolutely no sense and then people said, I've completely understood that? Have you had that experience? I bet I have. <laughs> I have to say more times than not, I feel like because of my intent behind it, people get what I'm trying to say. It comes across, whether it's the best word or not the best word. I feel like they understand my intent. Yeah. Rather 
than maybe the choice of words. Exactly. Yeah. They're like, okay, I get what you're saying. Maybe I didn't understand that full word, but yes, I got your concept. Yeah. So I feel like that's what's been happening. Yes. When I speak. Oh, Oprah would love that, right? I'm a big <laughs> Oprah fan, so I will refer to her. But her idea of intention, everything for her is about intention. If your intention is lined up with your soul, your heart, you can't say anything wrong. There's no wrong. And that, that to me was such a beautiful thing to be reminded of. And that's kind of what you're saying, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, that you're not unclear about your intention. You're very clear. My generation seems to be finding their voice now. And it really is amazing to, to see. So I'm kind of obsessed with how do we feel about speaking? How do we feel about what we say, what we're thinking? Is it becoming easier in a general sense? And I think it is. And it has to. I mean, to me, it's the only thing that's going to save us is sort of, well, Gloria Steinem's talking circle. She is devoted to that talking circle. So I went to this event last night for um, Women's Media Center and Gloria sort of stated in front of all kinds of people that it was a giant talking circle. Like that's her thing, you know? It's like, how do you get, pe how many thousands of people can we get into a room and have women talk to each other around the table with a glass of wine? Get them here now, you know? Mean meanwhile, raise some money, you know? Was, and I just, I'm just so impressed with it and I learned, I don't know, let's talk about the play a little. Like, now that you've been away from it for a few weeks, what kind of things have you been thinking about, Gabrielle? Related to the play? Or have you had to go blank a little? I wouldn't say I went blank. I feel like definitely this play has really opened my eyes to a part of Gabby that I wasn't... I knew she was there, but maybe I wasn't so willing to see or understand or even try to go into, like... My strength. I didn't even try to understand like my strength or how to use my own strength. I would say that because I never knew how many things as a woman, period, that we touched on in this play that I would make as a habit for myself that was honestly destroying me at, at the same time, like apologizing. Like the first thing we talked about was Stop. apologizing. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What am I sorry for? Yeah, no. like, and I and I brought it home to my family and my sisters. I'm like, what are you saying sorry for? And they're like, you are so right. I'm like, I, I just something as simple as that can yeah. make such a difference yeah. in how you see yourself, how you carry yourself, how you go into your everyday life, how you interact with people. Right. Like, I put my foot down so much more than I ever would have. Thankfully to this play, and thankfully to what I learned through this play and these stories of these women who fought so hard to have a voice. You know, yeah. I think, like, you, we spoke about in our talking circle about how young people, we take advantage of the rights we have now. I did. Yeah, I did. For I, sure. I know I, I did. Yeah. Especially, and this, like, put it in my face, like, you, you really don't understand what the fight really was. And right. I didn't. And I, I'm thankful that I got the opportunity to learn what it was really about so that I can cherish this moment even more, especially when now we're, they're trying to take back everything that people fought for, that That's women right. fought for. Right. So I'm, I'm, I don't take any nonsense. I'm a, I'm a no-nonsense, young, 24-year-old black woman and unapologetic for it. Wow. So I'm grateful yeah. for this opportunity. I really am so grateful. Like, it has literally shifted that my is focus. so great yeah the timing was perfect for you yeah. sounds like it, right it was it, it and was. how great that you took it back to your sisters mm -hmm. so you've only been not doing the play for two weeks and you've already gotten your sisters to change a habit mm -hmm. that we have all had by the way the apologistic exactly. uh, whatever i met i told you guys about this that when i was doing a tv show we used to go through and cross out all the apologistic language mm. and say to the wonderful writers who listen, why would a woman who's running a major crimes okay. division be apologizing for her ideas? Exactly. Do you know? But they don't. Even, but it, it's so in the culture that they didn't even realize they were doing it, right? Exactly. Mm. So not apologizing is a huge shift, Gabrielle. Yeah. It's a big deal because it changes your whole sensation of being on the planet, in my opinion. And what are we apologizing for? That we were born female or something? Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what the... F I'm not going to swear on this one. 
I'm not, well, I might. <laughs> I might. We'll see. Um, how about you, Petrina? Since the play ended, did, is there anything that, I mean, you've done it twice now. Right. So you're in a little bit different, it's very different, actually, than, than Gabrielle and my experiences our first time out. And did you feel, I, I, I'm sure you didn't learn a lot that was, well, maybe you did learn some new things. But is there anything different about the aftermath of doing it this time than you felt the first time? What, what's your sensation? Um, just that these, uh, you know, like Flo Kennedy says, if you're not living on the edge, you're taking up space. Ugh. And so for me, it's like, what does that, what does that really mean for me right. or for the women around me to right. live on the edge and not just take up space? I mean, you know, yes, take up space, but taking up space by being living on the edge. Yeah. Because things are so important and so urgent. You know, and also like holding the men in my life accountable for things that they say that I might have let them get away with yes. or was not even aware of right. in the past. Right. And I've already seen, you know, like uh, someone very close to me. I love him. He's a great guy. You know, but he sent me a text and I sent him a text about something and he said, oh, you know, effing women or something like that. Something to that, you know. And I know he was joking, but... I did. I, I texted him back and said, what do you mean by that? They're mm -hmm. not effing women or, you know, so yeah. I went and silence, nothing, no response. No, yeah, that happens. You know, it? so I can imagine <laughs> his head, he's going, you know, oh, she's just done that fucking play. <laughs> she did that damn play again and now she's on her high horse. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I really relate to what you're saying about wondering what does that mean? You're not living on the edge, you're taking up space. That really is a, I think a lot of people, not just women, a lot of people right now, we're trying to figure out what to do. Yeah. Because we do sense the, the entire the system has crumbled. It's not going to crumble, it has. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm saying it like I'm grieving. I am. I feel like I'm, part of me is in grief every single day. So Petrina, you were saying that you have a, you're questioning, what does living on the edge mean? Mm -hmm. How do you define that? How do you and the people you love and care about deeply, your friends, how do, how do you define it? Do you change your lifestyle? Do we all now just make sure we're getting by and make sure we march? I mean, what do we do? What is it? How do we begin to change? Well, there's something that you said every performance, which was, don't worry about what you should do. Do what you can do. Correct. Yeah. And I think if you really do what you can do, and if you're honest with yourself about what you can do, I think that is living on the edge. And that's so great. I don't think it's always about being super woman. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I don't think it's... Sometimes it's really quiet moments. Like, like for example, the text. Like, yes. it's that moment of, like, going, no, I'm not going to let this go unchecked. Yes. What does that mean? And it's in those moments. And, I, and for me, I think... That it's the everyday moments actually that ripple out. Yeah, it's not always the big moments at the you know on top of the mountain right. screaming in the bullhorn. It's yeah. Some it, it's sometimes it's those everyday moments that speak the loudest. No, I think because and great. it and it takes a lot of courage because you're dealing with people who you care about. Right, and they're expecting you to behave a certain way. Yes, and I think. I'm noticing that because we're all feeling the urgency, and I love what you're saying because you're saying even in the face of urgency of this magnitude, the simplest change in your behavior is changing everything. And I, I sometimes forget that. I sometimes forget that if you can approach your day looking people in the eyes on the street and saying, hello, yeah. how are you? that you really are changing the molecules. You're changing the molecules of how that person felt that day. And you're changing your own because it, it, that's where you feel happy. And I think that's kind of what I noticed when we did the talking circles, is that when people were able to speak their truth, and no matter how devastating their truth was, it wasn't too big for the people in the room. And that sort of just being acknowledged we're all going to hell in a handbasket but 
we could also go there happily. The happily, the, the hopefully, the lovingly, I think you're talking about love. I saw people, and I want to know what you saw in people, but I, I observed in our talking circles that people were, were able to feel a little bit of peace again after they spoke. And that is a, that's huge, the glory. That's a huge thing Gloria Steinem has done. Right? I would say that that is basically life, is if you can find respite, which is relief, yeah. ultimately. If you can find relief, in a stressful situation or a situation, any kind of relief. If it's literally relief as breathing. Right. It's connected to the to your breath. Indeed. And if you can find that relief, and I think a lot of people found relief in the talking circle to speak their truth and they can breathe. Right. That's right. It's amazing to witness, right? It is. Gabrielle, in the talking circle, was there anything that you particularly cherished? In the experience of people, young people, older people, and black people, white people, was there anything that you particularly tickled you or got to your heart? Well, what this brings up for me is, again, one of the quotes you say is, everyone's stories matters. Yeah. Like, everyone's story is of value. And you experience that in that talking circle. And one, one, just one woman that always is going to stick with me, all of them do, but one of them that just pricked at me, for yeah. lack of a better word, was when our speaker spoke about her assault experience. And then that allowed for so, such a sense of freedom to happen in the room that so many other survivors of it came up and said, me too, me too, me too. And it just like rattled yes. my, my, my spirit. Oh, what does that mean? Rattled my spirit. I love that. Because I have personal experience with it myself, and I never thought I'd say this out loud, but I finally feel, I took, I took myself home that day. I cried after we, we spoke, like we had that talk back, and I came downstairs in our dressing room, and I started to just cry, because I know what it feels like to feel what those women felt, but then I also know what it feels like to blame yourself, so you don't feel free to speak. So I was still not feeling that freedom in a room full of other people who felt free to say me too. Mm. And I went home that day and I wrote a letter to myself about it. It's called My Unfortunate Reality. And I decided from that night on, I am no longer going to blame myself for what happened to me. And I take this day as October 23rd, 2019. Me too. I am a survivor of it. I am stronger through it, and I thank God I didn't lose my mind for how long I kept it in, and I thank God for how strong I am now in spite of what happened to me. Ooh. Gabrielle, I had no idea. That is, th first of all, thank you for your generosity right here, right now in this moment, because um, that was a 100% in the moment just now. And those are the moments for our listeners that will help hundreds, if not more, women do it too. Wow, so thank you for that. You know, the admission of assault, the admission of insults, condescension, abuse. When I was doing the play, it occurred to me that I had like when Gloria says in the play, for years I put up with daily sexual harassment and condescension. You know, spent a lifetime not trusting my own experience. And that to me, when I read the play, jumped out at me more than anything else because although I haven't had an assault on the level that so many women and yourself have expressed, I had some really horrible things happen. As a young woman, I had a, a really beautiful boyfriend lose his cookies one night. It turns out he was a probably paranoid schizophrenic, but not really diagnosed nor treated correctly. A beautiful, beautiful young man who, who lost it. And I experienced people with guns. I experienced, uh, and until I did this play, 
would always say to other women, I'm so sorry, tell me about what happened to you. Because perhaps I had never ended up in the hospital, I never had depressed charges, or I never was raped, just say it flat out. I had created an idea around myself that somehow I had never, you know, I was not a victim. And that's just not true. And that's what the play taught me was I had to go back and really look at an entire lifetime of accepting less than respectful behavior. And so you kind of go, wow, Gloria, how onto something are you with this talking circle? Because, and with this piece and with these ideas, because we are just beginning to own what's been done to us. And we live in luxury compared to most women on the planet. If we look at the percentages, we're free women. We, we can aspire to our dreams. We can turn around to a guy on the street and say, fuck you, you know, if we want to. We're not going to be thrown in jail. <laughs> well, Mina and I might be if we go to Saudi Arabia, but I don't know. Uh, right? <laughs> We're always like, where are we going? What can we say here? <laughs> you know? I was in Dallas and I was in the middle of a talk and I went, oh, wait a minute. I was like going after, you know, that man in the White House and I thought, Oh, I'm in Dallas. Oh, well, love y'all. But they were there. They, were, they didn't mind. They didn't mind. I, it's, it's primarily a progressive audience that loves sci-fi. That's part of why we have so much fun when we go to these things, because the audience is so smart and progressive and interesting, and they're fed up with all of it, and they're waiting for this other level to actually materialize in reality. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Anyway not to go off. This was an amazing admission and I appreciate it. And I think that just now you gave me courage to talk about it, to sort of say out loud what it is that is the truth of my life. Many women in my generation have still not spoken to it. It's very hard to face what we saw our mothers go through knowing that they passed without ever admitting to the it of all abuse of all diminishment. It's all diminishment at the root of it all. Wow. How about you, Katrina? Do you feel like your life has been one of, if you had to measure, like if you had to weigh forward movement or struggle against? I, I see my life that way. Like a great deal of my life just felt like struggling against constant like it's not really moving forward, but I'm not going backwards. Mm -hmm. I'm fighting the good fight, and I'm fighting, and so it's good. And then somewhere along the way, it started to break open so I could build on forward movement. But I ask women this, and I ask young women this. Do you feel like most of your life is, is, is a lot of your energy going towards struggling against barriers, or is most of your energy going into creating the next forward movement from where you are now, even though that might imply some barriers. Do you oh, feel barriers? Interesting. Uh, yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Mean, um, usually, though, they're a <laughs> she shock. She says with a smile. <laughs> they're usually a shock to me because it's not like I wake up. It's not like I wake up and go, I'm black or I'm a woman. It's not, that's not the first thing that, you know what I mean? That's not yeah. the first thing. The first thing, Your I'm first like, thing is like, I, I want the bathroom, or I, the bathroom. I need some coffee. That's the first thing I think. I'm like, I gotta I know. use the bathroom. You I know. know what I mean? But, but then you get these moments where you're walking around and somebody looks at you funny or they say something funny to you. You know, they call you a nigger bitch or what, oh, you know, it's like, man. oh my gosh. You know, it's like, yeah, that's right. That's, that's the world I live in. There are these moments where intellectually you know it. You know that this is, you know, that there are uh, issues of race and, and, and gender and sex. and But then when it happens to you, it's like, to me anyway, it's a shock. And right. it's like, yeah, oh, so far to go. But if it's a shock, what I'm hearing in that is that you're spending a lot of your time moving forward. I th because I, then yes. you're shocked when the barrier comes flying at it you. It is because yeah, and that's what I so much love about Gloria Life because a lot of women do not, even though there are things we do go through, and there is there is room to grow, right? Most certainly, mm -hmm. 
But there are certain things that I don't face that my mother did. Right. You know, it just isn't. So when I hear some of the stories about the, the women said in the talking circles, you know, about not getting a job for this or you have to get a, a, a you have to go see a gynecologist or, you know, to get this job or that's not something that I ever faced. That just wasn't an option for for me and my, right. you know, that just is not something. It's like, no. Yeah. Uh-uh. Right. Like what? Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, um, where as for women in the past, and these are the strides that these women have made, you know, Gloria and Betty and Flo and Dorothy, yeah. Bella, yeah. you know, everything that they fought for has there has been definite improvement. And it, you can see it in the younger generation who just will not tolerate certain things. It's just not acceptable to them yes. to hear certain things that happen. That's and right. I think they're genuinely, they were genuinely shocked and perplexed even when they came to the show. Right. Like, this is what this, like, I didn't know. Right. I didn't know what it cost. Yeah. You know what I was fascinated by? I was thinking about it the other day. Remember the young woman who said that she was the only woman on a city council? She was towards the end. She might have even been the last day or the second to last day. And she said what really got to her was not that line about not trusting her own experience. Because even though she's a woman in her 20s sitting on a city council where there had never been a woman, she thought she had, you know, you don't have to worry about this stuff. Women can have whatever they want. But she realized that she still wasn't even saying, giving her own opinions mm -hmm. or contributing because she knew there would be blowback, but she took it for granted. And when she heard that line in the play, she was kind of devastated. And that's what I was kind of fascinated by, too, is some of the young women who, on the one hand, kind of what you're saying, Gabrielle, have experienced tremendous privilege and doing wonderful things with it all, took it totally for granted, and then started to realize that not only did these women before them have to work their asses off to get any of this, but that they were also being blinded to some of their own limitations yeah. that they didn't even realize they were carrying yes. because they had a, the MO is that you can be whatever you want. Yes. Yeah. Meanwhile, the negative images are coming in stronger than ever. Yes. yes. And the backlash against women in power is coming in stronger than ever. Yes. Right? right? So it's sort of, but I love hearing that, what you said, Petrina, because you indicate to me that you're very clearly involved in a life of your choosing rather than a life of reaction. And I think you certainly are as well. Would you say that's true? Now, now, I'd have to say that now. It wasn't, but now learning more. Yes. And absorbing more of what I needed to absorb. Yeah, I, I say that I'm living the life that I'm choosing right. to lead rather than some, like, my reaction or reflection of what somebody's trying to present to me. I would right. say that. Did That's that, what I've taken. Did that change for you in school? You went to Ryder, mm -hmm. correct? And do you got a BA in theater? BFA. What? BFA. <laughs> and was it, it, it was in musical theater, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have an outstanding voice for sure, among other outstanding traits. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But did that happen during school? Did it start to happen? Was it before school? Was it during school where you were you started to choose? When did you choose? It did start in school because mm. in school I started. I didn't. I didn't. I wasn't as educated in the theater world until I got to college. Right. So then I saw the certain types that people yes. would try to place you mm -hmm. in. Yes. And some people would try to say to me that, oh, you're just going to be this chorus girl kicking in the back, right? I'm like, no, that's <laughs> not, not what I aspire to be. Yeah. So I, I, I had to, sometimes I had to fight for it at first because yeah. some people see you first yeah. in this industry. They see what they what you walk into the room with. Yeah. So then they, they instantly depict how they feel you should be until you open your mouth. Yeah. And so a lot of people, I had to wait for them to hear me speak right. and hear me act and see me do these things before right. they were able to really see me as more than just a random black girl singing the soul, you know, as to say. Yeah. So I, I'm glad I had instilled in me from my parents that 
I can be who I choose to be. I know who I am and nobody else is going to define that for me. Right. So regardless of what people were saying, all their opinions, I was like, oh, that's a nice opinion. I'm going to do these roles, though. This is what I'm going to audition for. This is what I choose to have in my book. This is what I'm going to sing for this audition. because, And that's what I've been doing. I've been being true to myself. I started mm-hmm. implementing that. I'd say definitely in college because that's where I got exposed to those critiques that were coming back at you speaking something that was different to what limiting. I saw for myself. Yeah. yeah, limiting what And I wasn't saw. trying to limit myself. No. I was like, absolutely not. I saw how it affected some of my classmates who are not doing this anymore now. Right. Like, And it's so sad to see such rich talent, but if you as a person are not being fulfilled within yourself or you're not, you're not able to really produce what you want to produce because you're allowing those outside thoughts to really infect you it's rather than affect so you. So right. And that's been the issue with some of my classmates who aren't doing this anymore, which is so sad to see this waste, as Gloria said. What a loss. What a loss. When all of these great artists are doing the mediocre things compared to what they could be doing if they only had that self work. They didn't off. own it. Own it for themselves, yeah. And I'm glad that my mama and my daddy raised me to be like, you know who you are. Don't let nobody else define you. You know, God God can define you, but right. you also choose who you decide to be in this world. So mm. I walked with that. So truth. you had that set up internally yeah. from yeah. your parents. Yeah, I had that. I thank God for that because I could have been derailed by other people's perceptions of me if I didn't Absolutely. have that, that sort of high self-awareness for myself. So right. Definitely in college. I definitely in college. And what was your favorite role in college? In college? Okay, my favorite role, I'll say this because... you had, you, you played some really <laughs> good things here. here. I'll say my favorite role, even though it is one of the typical black girl roles, but it was my first lead role. So mm. people could see my talent. Yes broader than a girl just dancing in the chorus. And I was yeah. like, okay, you see me now. You see what work I can do. And then now these people started to put me in or consider me yes. for more roles. And I was yeah. like, are more in-depth roles that were opposed to the stereotypes. So I was like, completely. yes. So I'll say I was Sylvia and all shook up. So that yeah. started my, yes. <laughs> when they saw me. Right. So I think Isn't that. that it? Isn't that exactly it? When you finally play a role where you feel seen. It, it does change everything, really. And how astute of you to observe at a young age while you're in college, I know what you're talking about, observe your classmates being so eager to please what's being projected on them that they eventually get further and further away from their calling. Mm-hmm. I saw it too. I saw it in New York my first 15 years I lived here. I came into New York, the generation of actors that I was among in this city. Everybody was so broke. The city was broke. There were no lights. But because of that, there was theater everywhere because everybody worked for free. You know, I remember doing a play at um, this little theater next to La Mama where after they cast you, you had to sign a piece of paper saying you were willing to clean the bathrooms. We all had to sign up for bathroom duty. We worked for free, and we had to work to keep the theater maintained. But that was happening everywhere. But I had an apartment for $90 a month, so who cared? Who cared? We could live here on nothing. I watched people slowly over the years be so obsessed with trying to do what they thought they were looking for rather than bring in something they knew they had to offer that perhaps could solve the problem for the director and the producer and the writer. They would try to get ready to produce what they thought those people were going to want. Mm -hmm. And I watched people get further and further away from their raw talent that they came here with when they were 18. And So I do know, I've never heard anybody describe it like that. It's a great thing to think about because there are beautiful, beautiful talents out there who don't work and got further and further away from it. And I suppose on on some level that's life, but really the truth is if you don't drive your own engine as an artist, you are not going to be able to run into the opportunities that you will thrive inside of. Because if you show up and you're not driving, you're not gonna, it's not gonna see, it doesn't match, it doesn't meet up. That has been my 
experience. But if you continue to know the self, I remember one time thinking I was, I was auditioning for this huge Broadway play and I went in and did my big audition. And not only was he deeply unimpressed, sitting there like this. Mind you, there's no one else in the room. That was back in the day when you went into rooms with one man. But he asked me to leave the script when I left. <laughs> Not even like was polite enough to say, thank you, we'll be in touch. He just said, yeah, you might as well leave the script right here. And I remember thinking, I probably could have done what I thought he wanted because I've seen his plays and I know what women produce and they're kind of glorified victims, but I can't. But that's the risk, isn't it? Mm -hmm. How about you, Katrina? When did you start acting? I started acting in third grade. <laughs> yeah. Where? Uh, it was a school called PS138. Wow. In Brooklyn. Wow. And what was your, do you remember your first role? Uh, the first thing that we did was actually more of like a pieces that we would put together that we created. So right. There'd be some dancing, drummers, some singing, some... In fact, in high school, I was so bored with high school, the only reason why I showed up to high school was I joined the drama club, the dance club, the chorus, and uh, instruments. Wow. And, and swimming, also swimming. I love yeah. the pool. Yeah. And those were the only reasons why, if I hadn't, I wouldn't have gone to high school. Yeah, it was just, I get that. I was so over it. It was just like a yeah. graveyard. <laughs> it's just like, I don't want to learn about these white men anymore. <laughs> uh, I, I completely hear you, how that must have felt. But it was through the creativity that, you know, I found life. Yes. Yeah, being creative. Yeah. I'll tell you something. I didn't know I was smart until I started doing plays. I was a terrible student. I couldn't find myself. And then I went to college and followed a boy. And like, well, actually it was a girl. I didn't know I was an actress. And I discovered it in college my freshman year because I saw this woman I wanted to be friends with because they were making us roll toilet paper with our noses on the dorm floor because we were freshmen. Because back in those days, the girls were in separate dorms from the boys and they treated it like a sorority, even though it was just a dorm. So the freshman girls were supposed to be rolling toilet paper across the lobby with their noses. And, you know, the way I got through high school was I was a cheerleader because, as you know, I love football. So uh, then I cheerleaded for basketball and then I had a boyfriend who played soccer. So, duh. I couldn't do, I didn't swim in high school, but I swam. I was an athlete as a child. And I got to college, I had nothing. I didn't know what I was doing. I just got into a state school and went. And this woman, I saw across the lobby, this is my second day of school. She was sitting there. She had her legs up on another chair. One of her legs was in a cast. She had a bandana around her head, a big like flannel shirt. She's smoking a cigarette. And I was drawn to her like a magnet. I just got out of line and I walked around. Nobody saw me. I went over and I sat down with her and she had a cast on her leg. So I figured I could pretend I was taking care of her. And I said, hi, what's your name? She goes, Marie, what's yours? I said, Mary. And she goes, ah. And I thought, wow, who is this? And I said, I'm going to pretend that I'm your, you know, taking care of you. She said, good, because you're doing this stupid fucking thing. You know what I mean? So there was this rebel. She was already a theater major, and I started going to the theater with her, and she was the head of the props department. And she said, you want to hold some props during the, next, during the first play? And I said, yeah. And then I saw this guy who walked past, this boy, and I went, who is that? <laughs> and she said, he's playing the lead. He's playing Thoreau. It was the night Thoreau spent in jail, and I said, can I hold his props? <laughs> And she thought that was the funniest thing because she, no man was ever going to turn her head like that. And she goes, yeah, sure. But what happened was by the second week of the play, I stood back in the wings and I knew everyone's lines. And I was like, what is this? What is this? Yeah. And this thing just started to grow in me, right? And my father had said, take a theater class. So I took intro to the history of the theater or something, I started raising my hand. And suddenly history and mm. psychology and sociology 
and politics all started to make sense to me through dramatic literature. And it changed my life. So, I mean, acting, theater changes. And don't you feel grateful? Yes. I mean, yes. three years old, Petrina. Yes. Every, every, no, third grade. Oh, yeah, third grade. <laughs> That's three years old. Third grade. That's a little bit different. But I probably was acting. I'm sure you were like acting that. at three. Yeah, I I'm sure you were. You had a big family, right? <laughs> yes. Yes, yeah, so you yeah. had to get attention. Yeah. That's how I felt, actually. Part of me was like, didn't know I was an actress, but I was always trying to get attention. So what is your favorite role that you've ever played? I was reading an, or listening to an interview of yours about playing Paulina yes. in Winter's Tale. Yes. Did you love that? Um, not as much as one might think. It was Tell my second me, oh, time I'm fascinated. Paulina. Tell me why. Um, I... I have a relationship with Paulina. I'm pretty sure I'm going to play her again somewhere. Wow. I just have a feeling I will. Wow. Uh, my dream is ultimately to play Leontes. Oh, I would love are. to play Leontes because he's just bad shit nuts. He's nuts. He's nuts. such a misogynist. Totally and great the role. Misogynist, the, it's the misogyny that makes him crazy, you know? And Paulina and Leontes, as someone said, are two sides of the same coin. And he cannot stand Paulina, like he calls her a mankind witch, which is basically <laughs> saying you're a he she or you're a you, what do you think you are, a man? You know, because Paulina stands because up. Because she does. She's she, very direct. Know, yes. Paulina. So <laughs> um but I think my favorite role was actually the role that I had the least amount of lines in. It was in college. It was a, it's a play called Crumbs from the Table of Joy mm. by Lynn Nottage. Mm. And the character that I played was Ermina, or some people say Ermina. And she's the younger sister to uh, the lead character, mm. Ernestine. Mm. And that was probably, I had so much fun and freedom with that role. What so was it about fun. her that you love so much? Um, she's young. She's the younger sister. So what I found in her was just this very she, even though she's young she's her sexuality is it's the, it's an exploration for her mm. so there's another woman that comes on the scene lily mm. lily ann green i think is the character and through uh lily ermina sees something because she doesn't have her mom they mm. don't have their mm. mom mm. they they grew up uh, just with their father so when lily comes on the scene it's like oh my god who is this you know, and Lily smokes, and you know, and her <laughs> father is like pretty strict. He's he's um he's a follower of a man called Father Divine, oh, yeah. who's an actual person, right. and um so he's very strict in the household. And here comes this woman who's supposed to be a communist. Mm. She smokes. She's like you know yeah. And, she's um, free. She's free. And uh, Ernest, you know, Armina is just like she starts to mimic her, copy her, and. Oh, how you know? fun. And so it's like, for me, finding, like, especially with the sexual freedom of this of this young girl coming into her own womanhood, you know? Yeah. And I just found the playing with that, like, twirling my skirt or, you know, yes. playing with my bosom or... Yeah. And it was just, it was just great. It was just, oh. it was, yeah. So delightful. Which I don't, I, I don't like to wear skirts, pretty much, or dresses. That's right. just my thing. Right. But I do love to wear them on stage. Isn't that funny? I, yeah. I do love to We wear like to get dressed skirts. up, don't yeah. we? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that funny, but you don't like it in life? No. Do you know why? I think it's because I find it, it may be ideas I have around it, because mm -hmm. for me growing up, it's not the actual dress or the skirt, they're fine. But the ideas around it that women have to carry themselves in a certain way mm -hmm. in a skirt or a dress does not appeal to me, right. personally. Right. Do you mean carry themselves in a certain way to protect? Well, just, for example, the way a woman sits in a dress or a skirt. Yeah. She can't, you cannot sit like that. Right. Right. And I don't want anybody telling me I can't sit like that. Which I have seen some women in public with, and I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm like, yeah, do it. You know, they're, they're on the train and their legs are like, you know, they've got the spread going on and they're in a skirt or a dress and it's like, Okay. They're comfortable. They're, yeah. Yep. You know, so I don't like, uh, where are you going to say? No, no, go ahead. <laughs> so I, I, it's because I don't, 
there are certain expectations around that thing, which I find limiting. Right. And because I don't like limits placed on me. Right. And I think it's an I, more an idea than the actual skirt or dress. Right. I, I, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, I was just going to say. Gabrielle. So another thing that happened to me on the train, just coming here. You know how men like to do the man spread? Mm-hmm. Yeah, God, yeah. Oh, man, I wasn't taking it today. I was just sitting there because he sat after me. And so I just felt myself starting to widen my legs. Next to him, and his legs started to close. I was like, absolutely. You ain't going to man spread me. That <laughs> is I was hilarious. like, oh, nonsense. I was like, I never did this before. But was, something in me was just like, just spread. I was like, because I was looking at him. I'm like, why, why do I feel so crushed? And I was like, oh, no. And, then and he, started, he, he started. No, he just started to close off in himself. Like, yeah. I'm like, yeah, don't, don't spread me. But, yeah. No, I know. Them. You know, they do that on planes, too, with their elbows. Oh. Mm-hmm. Uh. It's like you're you get in your thing and you buckle up and everything and and then suddenly and then wanna... there's like spread out and it, like this. Well, you have no armrest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not no more. No, that is awesome. Yeah, that just felt great. Like yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's interesting though that you wonder if it's an idea or if you're responding to an idea that you don't have freedom. Yes, it's the it's the limitation. Yeah, it's the idea that. It's not the skirt, because I can wear a sarong, or it's not the thing. Yeah, You know, totally. I wear shorts, I wear, it's not, yeah. it's not, that's not what it is, it's what it represents, what it symbolizes. Yeah, mm. yeah. What does it mean to be a woman, and what's expected, of, and growing up, it's like, no, you don't sit that way, you don't, you carry yourself in a certain way, you know, which I find to be very inhibiting, and so... And it never made sense to me. There was never, ever a good excuse as to why a woman couldn't sit a certain way or jump or, you know, or just be free, just be free. It's just that you're wearing a dress or a skirt, you know, which I find in pants, you know. Yeah, you don't notice. Well, you don't, you don't, you can, you You can can do whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. Yeah. You can roll around. You can, you know, nobody's, especially as a young, as a child, you know, people are like, don't, you know, they're very protective of that, so. That's so interesting. Yeah. And it's like thinking of like the history, I remember a college professor saying that professors weren't allowed to wear trousers Beneath even the- up, yes, even up to the 70s. Yeah. That there was a change around the late 70s or the 80s is when that they started to break against that. But up until that point when they became professors, you know, school in school they could not just... So it's it's more the idea of what pants represent to me yep. and what dresses and skirts represent. It's a symbol I get as it. opposed to the actual thing. Mm. I get it. Because dresses are beautiful. I, yeah, there they are. I absolutely love wearing dresses, but I have, as I'm sitting here listening to you, kind of like what we were talking about earlier, I'm like, I have so completely absorbed the rules of how one sits. It would never occur to me to even want to in a dress sit like this. It's like, yeah. I gotta rethink that. <laughs> well, you know what I mean? Like, it's just so, oh no, you don't sit that way when you have a dress on. But I haven't questioned it. Yeah. Uh-huh. Isn't that interesting? I love hearing this. How about you with dresses, Gabrielle? Oh, I love to wear anything. I yeah. Know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I never thought of it the way you just explained it, Katrina. I never once, like, no. cause as you, I think of what you said, like, it's just been so normal. To just like, art's been so ingrained in me to just when you're wearing a dress, just be like this. I, I would never think to do this. Like, yeah. I just, it would never come to my mind. Yeah. But then, like, thinking of the, like, I never thought of the meaning behind what a skirt yeah. was. Or, yeah. You know? Yeah. It's like, because if a man wore a dress and he wanted to sit how he wanted to sit, I don't think anybody would say anything about it, yes, right? right? It's a man right. in a dress. Right. But if a woman in a dress sat a certain way, then it's mm-hmm. not acceptable. That's not normal. That's, That's not right. how you do it. You That's don't right. Do that. And it all comes down to it, doesn't it? It comes back to the same old thing. Who owns our bodies? Yes. Exactly. Them or yes. us. Yes. Exactly. And who put us in dresses to begin with? Who gave us the role that what women wear is something that has easy access? Right. So... I don't have to think about this, Petrina. You just may have ruined my life for the rest of us. What am I going to do now? I mean, when I look back at yeah. when I look back, I mean, look at the idea of a toga, yeah. for example. I you know, know what I mean? Yeah. Or you see, like, um, yeah. certain tribes yeah. in in Africa, they, they wear... Completely. Yeah. 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 
the men, men in skirts and the yeah. women pr- practically you naked know. and they're fine. Yeah. yeah. You know, so it's just, and certain, yeah, it's like the Amazonian tribes, they're naked. I mean, they yeah. might have a little thing around their waist or their, but it's just these ideas that go along with this specific thing and what it, it's just all limiting. Yes. Limiting ideas. And it has to be this specific thing. You know, it has to be a dress. Yeah. You cannot, like heels, for example. I think I read somewhere that heels were invented, actually, that men were the first to wear heels. They were, yeah. Because it was for horse riding, right. I think. Yeah. For the stirrups. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It wasn't about women's legs or anything. That took a while yeah. to evolve. Men would wear heels to get a good grip. Yeah. Yeah. And women didn't put their feet in stirrups. Sure. So they had on little slippers. Yeah. Of course, right, because they went... Side, 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 side. That's right. It's very interesting if you look, I mean, you know. So when we were doing Gloria a Life, one of the things that I found uh, one of the most interesting things for me personally and turned out to be, I think, in a general sense for the community, one of the, the more startling uh, realizations were the stories of the black feminists. I had simply no idea. And I grew up in that era. It isn't like I had no idea because I'm 24 and they didn't teach it in school. I knew who Gloria Steinem was. I made an assumption that she was born a feminist, had these great parents who sent her to the right schools, so she became a great writer and that was that. And how lucky was she? So when I read this play and I realized that she learned feminism from these extraordinary black women and that we were going to have a chance to tell people about them. That, to me, was the big takeaway. Still is, right? I mean, many, but that is the nut of it, particularly right now in the world that we are living in when, in my opinion, I want to hear what you feel, but as a white woman and an actress looking at the explosion of power among black women right now, whether it's politics, entertainment, education, doesn't matter what it is, to me, I'm seeing this beautiful, kind of revelatory for me, not as it's being revealed to me that black women are extraordinary and strong, duh, who doesn't know that on some level, but that there is a cultural shift right now that's allowing, or black women have finally pushed the door open. I think Obama and Michelle Obama, certainly in this country, took us a great, are greatly responsible for this opening moment. But I, I'm seeing it everywhere, whether it's Ava DuVernay in Hollywood or whoever. Just extraordinary power emerging from black women. I'll just talk about this country. And it's such a relief to me and so exciting. And I felt like this play allowed us into the actual truth is at the root of the strength of feminism in our country, it's black women. And we didn't know that. So there's a a long history of being ahead of the the curve, really. And I wanted to know from you two, as extraordinary black women that you are, really gifted human beings, what did that feel like to be able to represent those women and to what does it feel like to you right now? Do you feel the same way I do about where we are right now and how you relate to it? It's kind of a mixture of, like when I first heard about it, I was like, wait, what? Like just shock. And then it's like another feeling of, well, about damn time. About damn time that these women, these black actresses and black, great black Black actresses. Yeah, these black, no, actors. What are actors? There we go, let me say that. Right, black actors. I'm not going to say dress. So actor, these female black actors, these female black writers, these female black directors all coming up and speaking about what we should have been able to speak about because it's always been, as I say again, a pigeonhole or a stereotype that we have been constantly placed to play or constantly placed to portray. So I'm not surprised that we weren't told about this story about black women because they already told the story they wanted to tell about black women. I'm shocked that I didn't know it for myself. Like, I'm so sad that I couldn't learn about this in my textbooks. But I'm not shocked about it. That's Got a it. sad fact of the matter, you know? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The state of which, which this country I live in is. But I'm glad that I learned about it. Because now I have that much more of a 
appreciation for this history. Like, of course I'm going to appreciate this history. I'm a woman. But, like, even that much deeper, because I am a black woman, so seeing that this started from black women, too, I'm like, dang, we can, we can take ownership of that, too, not just the stereotypical, I'm, I'm a poor, homeless, broke, help, hooker, <laughs> like, all the things that we get accolades for, but mm-hmm. nobody's talking about this. So I'm glad that we're in a day and age where we have those Ava DuVernay's, yeah. those Regina Taylor's, yeah. those... Taraji's finally breaking out of those, yeah. those yeah. pigeonholes that they started out in. Yes. And I'm like, about damn time That's that so right. they're seeing us for what they should have been seeing us as. But I'm glad that we're now at a place where, where the door is open. So now we can surpass the stereotype or the lock that you try to put us under. And now we're telling our stories in spite of what color we are. Right. So that's where I'm at. It's so great. Home. Yeah. How about you, Katrina? Um, I feel a mixture as well. Uh, on the whole, because of everything that's going on, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, there's still there's still so much further to go. Right. But there had there's the scene, the explosion of Ava, Lena, right. you know, Taraji. I mean, yeah, Viola. It's just yep. Michelle. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Stacey yeah. Abrams. I mean, yeah. It's just. It's like, yeah, like you said, it's like, yeah, fine, like, come on, you know, yes. we've been waiting for this, and it's, because it's been negated all these years, the, and, and that's your presence, your actual existence has been negated. Negated. Your existence Your existence was is negated. like, yeah. so it's just, but I'm here, and it's like, and so, and it's not just for black women, it's for Latinx, it's, yep. it's, for, it's for every, you know, let's get indigenous women out there, indigenous yeah. men, let's get, we want to see what we actually have in this world. We want right. to see everyone's story. That's right. That's right. Do you think it's it will change, or do you feel it changing the business? Do you see different scripts? Do you see different things portrayed? If we continue, because I see it now right. in the theater, right, and in film, I see right. it on all mediums. And so, yeah. If it continues, mm-hmm. if it if it doesn't revert back to what it was before, which are there are people um, trying to trying to very right? hard. Right? Yep. And, but, so if we continue on that trajectory, I have no doubt in my mind that the scripts will be written, mm-hmm. and that you know it's just a matter of bringing those folks to the table. Yeah, it's just getting the folks in there, mm-hmm. yeah. and they're there. They're there. There's no excuse. It's like, I'm tired of people saying, no, we couldn't find any. Oh, no. please. It's a lie. I'm sorry. All That's people, always been a lie. All these people on the face of the earth. That you couldn't find. That's it, right. It, it, That's but, right. You, but you go to the moon. Right. But you can, <laughs> I'm here. Right. Here on earth, you couldn't find, oh, okay. Oh, That's right. Please. You know, so it's just, it's easy. we can find folks to do the work. And as long as we stay on that trajectory of like openness and diversity and inclusivity you know i agree with you and i am very cautious about the backlash because as we are experiencing as women and people of color right now as gloria says the backlash is in the white house and on the one hand it galvanizes do you know what i mean if there's a silver lining the silver lining is that we can't not talk now we can't not speak up. We can't not look at each other and say, we're in this together. I don't care what color you are. I don't care what gender you are. I don't care. How do you identify? Because I need to know how you want to identify. Because this is how I identify. But beyond that, we're exactly the same. And we are all in this horrible struggle right now together. And so I feel like on the one hand, there is this subterranean power emerging in all of us as a collective, as a global village that we, I was in Paris last year, and I don't go to Paris all the time, so I don't want to make it sound like that. It was the last time I was in Paris, but I've been there a couple of times in my life, and they've always been very nice people to me. I, I don't have a thing like, oh, the French are mean. I speak like pigeon French, so I get by and have long, pretty hair, so you know what I mean? But they were so nice this time. But they basically said, you now understand. We've been through it. We know what it's like to be overtaken by an autocrat. We know what it's like to have our democracies stolen. We know what it's like to hide in buildings. We know what it's like to be at war, to have 
our lives taken away, and then you fight back. So for the first time, Americans, and you know, many Americans say, I don't want to go to Europe right now because we're such idiots, and they, you know, look what he's done. No. In fact, what I feel happening is that the people of the world are coming together in response to the overlay of autocracy that does seem to be a, a conspiracy. You know, to quote Hillary Clinton years ago, there is a conspiracy happening to us. But to me, in this country, in our business, and as actresses, oh, I just don't want to see this go backwards again. Because as a, as a white woman, I find it boring to see what I saw most of my life growing up on television. Because first of all, it wasn't my experience that I was seeing as a white woman, right? Because not all white women have that right. experience that right. they have on That's TV. Right. Most don't. That's right. But also, where are, where's the rest of the world? I don't want to see like li the limitation reflected. I want to see the diversity reflected. And I'm very comfortable with that. But I, being a white woman and existing in that world and having worked for 40 years inside the patriarchy of the entertainment industry, the point of view. I know that a backlash is always simmering. So I'm very curious to know, you know, what powerful black women and Latinx women, gay women, you know what I mean? Where are we? What are we all feeling? Are we going to be able to keep this moving forward? And what do we have to do, like you're, to bring to your first statement? What is it that, what do I have to do to make sure that they don't send us back into, you know, leave it to beaver land? What would you say to young black women? Like, you're only 24, so that's really young, but there's 12-year-olds and 10-year-olds and your nieces and nephews and children. And Do you turn around to these young black females? I'm talking about females right now because that's really... I love men, don't get me wrong, but what I'm committed to right now is keeping women's voices alive. And I want to know, what do you say to these girls? Because they're getting, a, in my opinion, a completely mixed message. Because they're seeing you. They are seeing these actresses on television. They are listening. They are learning who Ava DuVernay is. They're seeing Kamala Harris running and taking the time to hold their hands and tell them they can win and that she, you know, they can be leaders and they can be presidents and they can be anything they want. And yet, they're going to school frightened and they're seeing their Latin brothers and sisters being put into cages at the border. So how do you talk to young black girls and, and boys, I suppose? What do you say? What do you feel? about what they're seeing. I'm asking because I don't know what to say. I don't know how to, you know, my kids are sort of grown, obviously, so therefore they're, they're already cooked. I don't have young children, but I look at my nieces and nephews sometimes and think, you know, and, and my, like, I'm a, gr I'm a great uh, aunt. I'm not a grandmother yet, but I'm a great aunt several times over, and it's like, I look at my nieces and nephews and think, I don't know how you're raising them. What do we say? Is this a good time or a bad time? You know, that's kind of what I'm thinking I think about. it's, a, like Wilma says, it's always a good day. Every day is a good day. Yeah, there you, you go. Know, like, every day is a good Wilma. day. Wilma. Um, that's Wilma Mancular. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> the pushback wouldn't occur. Yes. Or the backlash wouldn't occur if something good wasn't happening. There is forward momentum, and that's why there's a push. Back. back right so there's your hope we have to keep looking ahead we have to keep you know it's almost like lot's wife i don't know how many people are into the bible you know oh, don't okay. look back don't look back tell the story you cannot you know so what, what is what is a lot they were they were running away see the one that was going to turn to salt stop. A uh, stone, so, stone. Salt. Salt. Pillar salt. Pillar of salt. salt. Pillar of salt. Because yeah. Because she turned back. But what was the what was the dictum? Don't look back. Because Don't look back. You can't keep. Sometimes you have to look forward into the unseen reality. Oh, that's great. It is I not yet that. shaped. We can't see it, but we know that it's done. Looking back at something, even though it's destruction and hell back there, 
Yeah. It's something familiar and something that we know. So we get drawn back. So we get drawn back. Mm. And we turn into a pillar of salt. Mm. But you have to look forward. Even though you can't see the thing that is yet to be, you have to believe. And that's where faith, mm. trust, hope, all the things that we need to, to thrive, love, peace, harmony, you have to look forward to those things and know that what it is you want to speak into existence uh -huh. is already present. Uh huh. That's beautiful. Speak life into these young people. Yeah. Right. And allow their faith, their hope, their joy, their love, everything be stronger than that back there. That that's essence, I call it spirit, spirit of fear that yes. they're trying to instill in you. Don't let that infect you. Mm. It can affect you, but allow it to propel you to continue to move forward that faith, that hope, that love, that joy. And let that be your horizon. Yes. As long as you're focused on that, don't there's always gonna be a backlash, there's always gonna be haters, there's always gonna be bullies. But at the end of the day, who are you? And who are you going to choose to be? Right. And do you both feel that you have faith as a pillar inside of you? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> for me. For me, for me yeah. it's an everyday struggle. To, it's an to, everyday, yes. To struggle to, to what? To have faith. In what? In whatever the dream is. Right. To have faith. Even though I can't see it at this moment, I know that it's already spoken into existence. And you have a practice? You say you struggle? Do I you meditate. Practice? You meditate. I meditate, yes. And you um, do a specific kind of meditation, or would you say your meditation is... Sometimes I, um, because I read Abraham Hicks. Yes. So she has this thing that she calls a rampage of appreciation, which I did on the train over here, which is that you see something, because the whole idea is that if you're on a rampage of appreciation, you can't be in the, the mode of lack. Right. Or of, of like, oh my God, or, or desperation, or if you're busy appreciating something or someone, you can't be judging them right. or judging that thing. Or being stressed. Yeah, or being stressed. So that's what I did on my way over here. I was like, you know, I started off with the train coming. I was like, I'm so grateful that the train yeah, came on time. I'm so grateful. And then so it, it's a rampage. It starts off with one thing. I love that. that. I've see, never and heard that. Just, you just go on a rampage of appreciation. That is the best Appreciate part. everything. I love that. So by the time I started with the train and by the time I got off here. You got like, out here. You're just full of life. I'm so appreciative that I woke up this morning. I'm so appreciative yeah. for the breath that I breathe. I'm breathing right now. I'm so appreciative that my head feels lighter right now, that my heart feels lighter right now. I'm so appreciative for the variety of this train car. I'm so appreciative <laughs> that that guy has a city bike. On yeah. the... <laughs> I'm so appreciative that this car is actually quiet right now. I'm yeah. so appreciative, you know, so yes. yeah. I love so that. So it puts you on that rampage of appreciation. And so, it takes you away from, because if you're not appreciating something, you're probably judging it or, yes. you know. Or, Absolutely. Yeah. There's yeah. a very little in between, yeah. isn't there? And the thing is, you can't do both. You can't do both time. at the same time. You can't you right. appreciate that. Right. Yeah. And what about you, Gabrielle? Do you have a practice of faith? Is there oh, something? Oh, yes. What is Jesus, yours? All the way. Oh, yes. we got it. Jesus, all the way. Saying like I put like, in, especially in this world and day and age, where so much toxic, this is happening. Yes. Like it's the only way, my faith is the only way I haven't lost my mind. Like I, I can't, you. I can't lose my, I don't lose my, I have too much faith. I have too much hope instilled in me to allow things to infect me and for me to. Yes, I may bend. I'm not perfect. Yeah, I'm gonna have my moments. We're human, right. but I'm not gonna stay there. Yes. I'm not, I, I refuse to stay sunken. I refuse to stay sulking. I refuse to stay in this pit of doom that everybody's saying we have around us. No, 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 no. My hope is built on nothing less. I, I have Jesus Christ. That he helps me. I pray. I pray. I pray. I go to him for everything. Like, that's me. Like, that's just like the source of my life. And that's, that's how I have so, like, in spite of it all, I have joy. And no one can take it from me. There's a difference between happiness. You can be happy joy. sometimes, but there's joy. Joy unspeakable that I always have. So. Do you go to church? Every week. <laughs> I try to ah! I, I, I know that's not practice. I do well, I have contracts, so then I can't. But when I'm back home, yes. I go to church. Yes. Yes. And where's your church? In Queens. Uh, Queens. Church of God of Promise. We actually just had a, a women's retreat this Oh day. my god. You know what the funny thing is? When you were speaking about wow. trying to figure out what to do or like who to speak to, like we had this 
I, I and my sister had this workshop, and then she wanted to sit in a circle, and I like, uh, I was like, yeah. I'm um, a circle girl. Saying, yes, yes, yes. I'm like, we're going to make it like a talking circle. So then we're speaking in this room of all these women about our issues and things that come up, our rise in our lives. And little did we know, if we just speak in these rooms with women, mm. some of these women, you didn't know that you had a woman that could help you to your next journey sitting right next to you. Right, right next to right. you. Somebody, you're trying to plan this thing for right. your life, and you have an accountant sitting right next to you. Somebody yeah. who studies in this sort of field, and they're all sitting in the same room yes. as you. And yes. you realize we're each other's help. So, like, we, we can be our sister's keeper, as, in a sense, but we don't think about these things because we're not talking to each other. We're just, yeah. like, thinking we're on this struggle by ourselves. No, you're not alone. Just sit down. It's easy. Like, it's, it, we can sit down and have a t- conversation and realize, oh, my God, the solutions can be in each you're other. So right. You're so right. Yes. And we don't yes. know this. Yes. And, I, and it hit yes. me. Like, I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. We, we have the solution, but we're Wait, not right. using it. We're not utilizing it. Yeah. We have to utilize it. That's we right. To, we have to speak. Yeah. That's how it starts. You gotta acknowledge it. Speak it. Speak right. life. Speak it into existence. And then see what comes out of it. Who can help? Yeah. Who can yeah. help? Don't look up. Look, look out. out. <laughs> yeah, Gloria. Exactly. Everything comes back to Gloria. Exactly. The big G is. Look out. Well, ladies, I could talk to the two of you forever. <laughs> and I will say that I was sitting here thinking, we're gonna have to revisit. We're gonna. This will be part one, mm-hmm. and then eventually, Mina. I think you brought this up to me at some point to be able to. Do you remember what you said your idea was for the whole group to circle back? I think it was the idea of taking the, the cast into a talking circle. You guys kept asking out into the audiences, but I'd love to have all of you bring that in mm-hmm. to each other. Right, and I and I, I do too, and I think that what I experience today I would love to expand into a bigger circle of all of us because we went through a major thing together Mm -hmm. and what we've discovered is that what I hear from the both of you is that it's supported in both of you if I heard you correctly what we experienced as actors and sisters doing that play supports the pillars of faith inside of you everything you learned came back to you and took you further and you're more on the track than you were perhaps before you did the play but just listening to the two of you at the end here describe your faith is so beautiful for me it's so hopeful and it's so brave and that's another thing that i just want all women to start talking about is if you have faith describe it share what inspires you. How do you get up every morning? What is it you build on? How do you transform the neurosis of any given day into gra- gratitude? Like, what did you call it again? Rampage a of rampage of appreciation, which is the best term I think I've ever heard in my life, right? <laughs> okay. And what happened with you this week with your sister, and you saw clearly what Gloria said, which is look to each other. The answers are in each other, I I thank the both of you from the bottom of my heart. I love you so much. You're both so beautiful and smart and articulate, dare I say, and eloquent (laughs) and funny. And I'm very happy to know you, and I just encourage both of you to keep putting out in the world what you do because uh, it'll be transformational. If there's two of you walking around in this city today, Mm -hmm. we're in good shape. So I thank you so much. Thank for you, coming. Mary. Thank okay. you so much.